Good afternoon and welcome to our latest um, webinar, which I'm hoping is going to, to help people in this current situation. And uh, we're going to be talking about working from home, a discussion of the legal issues in these challenging times. Um, most of you know me, I'm Catherine Metters, and I'm going to be um, sort of hosting and, um, and interrupting uh, Simon today, who is going to be um, helping us with this topic. Um, Simon Johnson Bechal is from Turnstone Law, um, and he's widely regarded as one of the UK's leading health and safety lawyers. Um, he's a director at Turnstone Law um, and has previously qualified as a doctor, which I think is particularly um, uh, important, I suppose, uh, on the discussion today. So he's in a unique position to, to help deal with um, the technical safety and health related uh, legal issues. Um, in addition to defending health and safety enforcement, he focuses on training senior management and advising organizations on legal preventative measures to reduce the likelihood of prosecution in the event of an incident. So I think we are in very, very good hands today. Um, we do have an ability to um, ask further questions. You'll find a question panel um, on your screen. Please um, put your questions in there and we will attempt to, to answer those. We are also going to be recording, or we are recording this webinar. Um, so if um, you have any technical problems, please be assured you'll be able to get it on our website. So really, um, without further ado, can I pass on to Simon? Simon, can you uh, help enlighten us on this topic? Well, thank you very much, Catherine, for inviting me to join this webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I hope everyone is uh, uh, feeling okay. Um, hopefully uh, not too much coughing and uh, um, high temperatures around. Um, now, okay, so let's go straight to it because I think we've, with the questions you've asked me to come and address in this webinar, we've actually hit a very rich seam of uh, problem issues that are worrying, particularly worrying the health and safety uh, people at uh, all organizations, but particularly those office-based organizations that can indeed send people to work from home. And so the basic question is, we're, this is the, the, the basic thesis that I think we're here for is, um, we're now moving from small percentage of home working or agile working where a small percentage of working time is spent at home to a period uh, where the vast majority of our workers our office-based workers are going to be working from home, uh, many of whom are not set up for it, haven't really done it before. And yet we've still got the same health and safety obligations. What are we going to do about it? How can we comply with our obligations, uh, comply with the criminal law? And as a solicitor, I'm for me as a specialist health and safety lawyer, the focus really is criminal law. I know there are allied issues of are we going to be sued and are we going to have to pay compensation for people's bad backs? Um, uh, we can talk a bit about that sort of thing and in the context of insurance, but my focus really is the criminal side of health and safety. So it seemed to me, um, and I think it's the next slide, Catherine, you're kindly doing the slides. It seems to me that your board of directors should be asking these cut through questions. If they can't be bothered and they haven't thought about asking them, well, you should be asking these questions to yourself and saying to your board, by the way, you ought to be asking yourself these questions and I can tell you where, um, what answers I've got. Anyway, that's what I reckon. So I think the first thing is we need to think about what are our health and safety criminal law obligations in dealing with this virus. Now that is a general question that goes beyond home working, office working, it's actually, uh, and, and in fact, some of this, some of the slides I'm going to talk about, they work equally well for home office working issue as they do for all the other difficult decisions with this virus. So there's things like, do we send our workers out into that uh, place where they could get infected, whether that's in their commute or in their travel for work or in visiting people's homes as part of their work? or whatever it is, and every business is different. Um, and this, these formulated questions really apply to any health and safety issue to do with the virus. So what are our health and safety criminal law obligations? What do we have to do? And uh, 
how can we protect ourselves from blame if we get it wrong? That's really important because I think most of you are coming to the table on this topic with saying, we can't really do it all properly. This has all come too quick. It's too difficult. We, it's not quite business as usual here. And although we normally try and be uh, compliant, we're not going to manage it or we may not manage it. So how can we protect ourselves from blame if we get it wrong? I think that's a very important part of it. So those are the questions and hopefully we'll go, I'll go on to answer these. Um, and uh, do please type in your questions as we go along. Um, and Catherine's gonna help uh, um, uh, grill me on it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. For me, what this is all about is identifying that whatever the issue is, whether it's the homeworking or any of the other related virus questions, you go to, a lot of the decisions are easy, fine. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. But there is a group of decisions that I'm going to call difficult decisions. Those are the ones that are troubling you and ought to be troubling uh, your directors. Um, and I, I've split them into two types. There are generic decisions that all employer, employers are facing at times of the virus. You know, should we put sanitizers and make them available? in our offices and uh, um, should we uh, try and encourage people to work from home and all the rest of it so for those generic decisions you can uh, you, there may be some guidance there may be guidance by the nhs by the, uh, the department of health um, or by the government and you can follow guidance to a degree follow the crowd of people not the crowd not the general crowd but the crowd of responsible employers uh, for ideas, certainly, you can look at the best people and get ideas. So those are the generic decisions. But then, and I think this is really what I want to focus on, there are specific questions for you. And you can't go on just with the generic stuff. So the specific questions for you, your, your organization, think about the demographics of your workforce. So if there's a special issue with your workforce, um, whether it's uh, their health conditions, their age, their susceptibility. One of the questions was, what about pregnant women? Um, think about your people uh, uh, and what, uh, and of course the third parties, because uh, although in the traditional office, co office um, issue of sending people to work from home, there aren't really third party involvements uh, caused, uh, there aren't third parties who are going to be injured by your activity being bad. Um, if you're sending people out to do visits into people's homes, for example, uh, a part of what your company does is send people out to fix people's boilers. You need to think about third parties or you, or you retail and people are visiting your shops or, you know, we've got to think about the safety of other parties. So there's that, there's the geography. So if you're in London, you probably need to be uh, a week ahead of the learning curve than if you're um, not in London. Um, and uh, there are other hotspots, of course, uh, to think about. Then there's working practices. How are things done by your business? Um, to what extent are they special issues that create special um, health and safety risks? Um, you're all gonna be different on that. And then I think a really interesting one, which I raise, which I don't think many other people have got their heads around, but I'm only really starting to, is this issue of social utility or the necessity of your operations. So look at it this way. If what you do is so necessary that you have to do it, even if you may be skating a bit, a bit on thin ice with uh, getting all your safety precautions right, Given where we are in this um, uh, contagion, I think that has to feed into what is reasonably practicable, which we'll come to. So if, for example, you are a healthcare provider, um, you might find that you've just got to get on and do things, even though your staff are exposed to risks that you wouldn't always ordinarily expose them to. So uh, if, you know, for example, a GP practice, has a receptionist who's exposed to people coming in and out the door and the virus. And uh, there's difficult to find ways around it. You need to do everything reasonably practicable. But at the end of the day, you're gonna be partly excused whatever you've done because of a kind of social utility necessity type argument. 
that's all I'm raising. That will apply to some of you, but it might be your office is arranging the logistics of some operation that is part of the national emergency. Well, there's, there's or delivering food even, or it could be anything. Um, there's a social utility topic, which in times of crisis, you've got to stretch yourself thin. You may not have fully complied with all the technical health and safety laws, but I think uh, that could be a part of the picture that I just want to raise. Um, let's go to the next slide, please, Catherine. So, what are the criminal health and safety law obligations? I'm not going to go into much detail here. I figure many of the audience are pretty good on understanding um, uh, what the health and safety rules are that are relevant. So there's the Health and Safety at Work Act, HSWA, and all the general duties apply to, to everything reasonably practicable to look after the safety of your staff. Criminal offence if you don't. Then there's the management of health and safety at work regulations, the management regulations, and in particular, the duty in the management regulations um, to do a suitable and sufficient risk assessment for um, uh, the work, work activities. So a suitable and sufficient risk assessment, that's a really important duty to be at the forefront of your mind. So that applies to all of the COVID related health and safety issues you need to risk assess. Um, and it equally applies to um, home working and using office type equipment in the home. And I think there's an interesting interplay between the Management of Health and Safety at Work Act general duty to risk assess and the duty in the Health and Safety Display Screen Equipment Regulation, which we call the DSE regulations, the duty there, which is also to risk assess, but this is specifically for the display screen equipment and the whole of the workstation. Um, there's an interesting interplay there because the DSE regulations, first of all, they set out in a schedule, a series of specific requirements for the workstation. And the workstation is defined and it's very broadly defined. So if your employee is sitting on a, when they work from home, is sitting on the sofa with a coffee table and a laptop in their lap on the sofa and um, a dim, not very good lighting in the room. That is the workstation that you as an employer are um, in, using for your employee to do the work. It is the workstation the sofa and the coffee table. So, and you've got specific regulations in the schedule of the DSE regulations, and very likely you will be blowing those out of the water and failing to comply with almost everything in that schedule for the worker who's on the sofa. But then Simon, there may be, yeah. Can I interject here? I think probably one thing we probably need to mention, and I suspect you're going to mention it later, is obviously within the DSE regulations, there is some guidance about portable equipment and, and and changes for portable equipment and for me that might come into to play for a first couple of you know week or two when when people are first home but I think we have to be very aware that um, portable workstations may turn into more permanent workstations if the period of being at home is longer so I'm sure we'll cover that later but I just thought it was worth putting it in because that is yes. within the regulations. Isn't yes it? and there are issues about what do you do at different stages and how yeah. far could you go on day one and but then what have you got to do by by by, by a couple of weeks in. Yeah. I mean I'm picturing I'm picturing this person on the sofa then there's one person better who's got a dining table and a dining chair and so they're not on the sofa and they're still using a laptop hmm. and then there's someone who's much better who's actually got a home office type setup. They've got a desk, they've got a desk chair, they've got a PC or, uh, and they're pretty good and they can log in with their PC. Um, so there is a range of people at home and that's part of the issue. We're aware of that, um, how we're gonna deal with the different people. The point I wanted to make when we've got this screen, this screen up is that the, technically the Obligations in the DSE regulations are strict liability. You breach this piece of criminal law if your worker is working at home 
with uh, on a sofa that fails that doesn't meet the schedule for yeah so you are in breach you've committed a criminal offense um but bear in mind the management regulations which is more nuanced requires you to do a risk assessment and i would say that uh, and the health and safety work act requires you to do everything reasonably practicable and i would say that if you meet the requirements of the first two bullet points you're pretty well protected if you fail a technicality on the third so simon that actually answers or hopes to answer one of the questions we had which said do you think that the enforcing authorities would be more lenient in view of the unprecedented circumstances yes. in the event of a claim and that's i think that's exactly that, that... the question and that question gets asked in a variety of ways and everyone's it's going around people's heads and i think the answer is i can't tell you you haven't broken the law and you know that that's why you're worried about it yeah you know that you've failed to meet the dse requirements but my partial answer to the question is as long as and it's not easy as long as you've met the hswa requirements to do everything reasonably practicable and you've got a convincing argument there uh, because we're only three days in we've sent a thousand people to work from home we're three days in and of course some of them are still on the sofa with a laptop but we've got a plan and a program and we've risk assessed it and uh ask us again in three weeks and we'll take and, and, and we'll have sorted it yeah you in that scenario you may well have done everything reasonably practicable and you may well have properly risk assessed under the management regulations and so even though you might technically in breach of the DSE regulations, you're perilously like unlikely to be prosecuted. So if you are you prosecuted, you would raise as mitigation. Come on, I've done all the rest. Do you think people need to sort of write this plan down then? So if they're ever asked to show their working, as it were, that would be a useful thing to do. Most definitely. We're going to come to that. That is going to be that's where I kind of end up on that. So okay, yes, I'll leave you to most it. definitely. OK, and then there's also civil contingencies, emergency legislation. God knows what that's going to say. Well, we can start guessing. We can see the sorts of things that are happening. But um, uh, in a sense, is it health and safety? Well, it's to do with catching infections and isolating and things like that, I guess. Let's have a look at the next slide. So what do you have to do? Ah, Well, look, there we are. Risk assessment. I think that is that's the key to this. You need to not only do a risk assessment, whether, and again, I'll take you back, whether we're talking about a whole range of COVID type things and COVID type decisions, nothing to do with the home working one, uh, commuting, people in the office, sanitizers, uh, dealing with sick people and at work leaves, absent, all those things. It, it applies to all of that, but it also applies to the uh, people you're now saying, please, will you work from home? So risk assessment is the key. You need to do it and be seen to be done it. And I think this is an important, this is the legal test really, um, that I think you should bear in mind, although it doesn't deal with that strict liability DSE point, but this is really the one for you to bear in mind. Would it have been reasonably practicable to have done more? That turns, turns back to front the legal test, which is you commit the offense if you've not done what's reasonably practicable. So if you are, but which is quite tricky. So I, I sometimes find it good to, to switch it around. Would it have been reasonably practicable to have done more? If the answer is no, we've done everything. There's nothing more we, that was reasonably practicable. Then you're in a good space. But if the answer is, well, I suppose we could have asked them if they've got a desk chair. And if they said we don't have one, I suppose we could have arranged for one to be delivered, whether it's their desk chair from the office or from our pool of old desk chairs in the office that are still compliant or from uh, a, a provider who's going to we're going to make a deal with a provider who's going to quickly provide a whole lot of office furniture and desk chairs to those people who need them, not to everyone, but to those people who need them. If it's reasonably practicable to have done that, and that may not be reasonably practical on day one, but maybe on day 10 or 20, it is. Um, 
then you, 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 you're landing yourself in trouble if it was reasonably practicable to have done more. So that should be your, 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 your watch line. That should be the question you should keep asking yourselves. Um, now, uh, what's this point? You should take into account the special circumstances of your organization. Yes. So in answering the question, how far is reasonably practicable? And that's one of the questions we've had, I think, is where do you draw the line? Well, we don't draw, we can't always draw the line. The line is really difficult to draw, but you should take into account special circumstances of your organization and this virus. And you are allowed to say, you know, uh, pray and aid the fact that we're in a civil emergency and all sorts of things have happened quickly. But once they've happened and you've done them, then you can't keep arguing the same thing if you could have done more over the next few weeks. Let's move to the next slide. How to protect yourself from prosecution if you get it wrong or from blame? The two are related, I guess. Um, they're certainly related, I'm not guessing. How do you protect yourself from blame if you get it wrong? Um, this is my... Um, formulation this is really the nub of my advice prioritize and balance the life and death decisions against dse technicalities in other words what i'm saying is here go don't drown yourself in the technicalities of that schedule of dse um, you've got to balance it the balance will be different for all of you and you're entitled to and you should prioritize so if the main priority is how are we going to deal with our pregnant women with a particular issue um uh, and that comes first then that comes first fine um and uh life and death decisions yes how are we dealing with um uh, people who are elderly and frail or whatever it is still on or uh, we still might have slightly older people or people with with vulnerabilities have you asked yourself the questions do we know from our hr records which people have um have got immunosuppressed or they've got cancer or whatever we need to think about their vulnerabilities in making the balances and how we're going to deal with them. So there's all those balances. It all has to be balanced. And then, yes, the DSE technicalities are in the mix. Balance your commercial decisions against the health and safety benefits. So um, you all have to take decisions. A fully compliant workstation. Um, I can't answer. I, I can't say. So the law requires you to create a fully compliant workstation for everyone, even in their homes, if they're doing work, if they're working at home. So I can't say to you, uh, the law doesn't require you to do everything. But what I can say to you is you just got to strike a balance. And all of you are striking a balance, balance. And if you become too dictatorial about those requirements, you'll drive everyone mad and you'll probably end up being sacked. And it won't really do your company any favors. So we've all just got to be balanced about it. But at the same time, be aware you may get it wrong. And I don't know if this is my catchphrase, have foresight of hindsight bias. So you need to think now, what happens when I get it wrong? What happens when I get it wrong? So if I get it wrong, and uh, Catherine and I were discussing earlier, and one of my people at home can't adjust the screen to avoid glare from their living room window. Um, what's going to happen? Well, not much. But on the other hand, I've got someone who's had, and this was one of the questions we've had, I've got someone who, who's had uh, three years of complaints with a bad back. We did everything to sort them out when they were in the office, and now we've just sent them home. Are we going to get blamed when after three months of working at home on the sofa, they are completely crippled by, by um, musculoskeletal disorders that were perfectly predictable. Uh, yes, and so, so have foresight of the fact that, that the hindsight bias will be used against you. Um, this is the point Catherine made, the benefit of a written risk assessment or record to demonstrate the balancing decision making. So this is so important and it takes you beyond COVID with all of health and safety difficult decisions, which is if you think something's a difficult one with arguments on both sides, and frankly, you think we're not, maybe we're not, we're on the edge of, of working out whether we've done everything we should be doing. That's the time 
to write down whether you call it a risk assessment or a document or a memorandum of a meeting or a discussion paper uh, which says we have looked into this issue on the one hand we ought to be thinking about and then these are the requirements on the other hand for the following reasons um, it's not practicable reasonably practicable to do that at this stage so we have reached a decision that we're not going to do it but we will monitor and review so you've then got that document which is a very valuable document if it goes wrong or you're blamed with hindsight you can say look this is our risk assessment we thought about it we weren't just willy-nilly breaching the law and for the really difficult decisions which is probably not just about your office furniture generally excuse me i'm going to cough that doesn't mean i'm in quarantine <coughs> excuse me for the really difficult decisions um as a specialist health and safety lawyer you you would involve me and i would have the discussion with you and we could protect the discussion documents or the draft documents with legal privilege so that in this privileged discussion we can we can make all the arguments yeah but this is a really big problem if we do this then we could you know we could we end up uh, having very serious consequences um, we can have those discussions then reach a view and we can effectively cloak those discussions whether it's in writing or verbal um, with privilege protection which means that they may not have to be disclosed to the prosecutors or the people suing you for compensation if you get it wrong i've probably rambled on too long it's time to be interrupted and asked questions well it will come as no surprise simon we have hundreds well probably no, probably not hundreds but certainly a lot of questions i've been reading through them i'm going to try if people forgive me to try and group them together because some of them are on a very common theme um one of the one of the first ones is about insurance about people who are usually employed in the office and are now at home and people are slightly concerned about insurance uh, do you want to make a comment on that yes okay well first of all i'm not the insurance is to do with uh, civil compensation which is not my absolute specialty but i can i can still guide you on this um, Generally, your office, your, your compulsory employer's liability insurance gives you cover for office work-based injuries. So work-based injuries in the home are going to be just as easily covered as workplace injuries in your factory or your office. So you're covered when someone, um, I suppose, to, you know, to stretch it, someone gets an electric shock from their desk lamp whilst they're working on your work um, that's potentially a workplace injury put it this way if it is a workplace injury and they sue you for compensation your insurer ought to respond to that because it's already been decided by the court that it is a workplace injury i mean if it's not a workplace injury then uh, you shouldn't have to pay up so say for example someone trips on a on the ruck in the carpet when they're going to make themselves a cup of tea whilst they're working from home. Well, you could argue forever whether that would be a workplace injury, but if it's not a workplace injury, you shouldn't be liable. If it is a workplace injury, your insurer should cover you. So I think you're pretty okay on that question. I would say, however, that it would be prudent to drop a note to your insurer to say, just to let you know, we normally have 5% of our workforce working from home. Uh, in view of the uh, virus, that figure is now 95%. So I think it would be prudent to let the insurer know that. Uh, but I doubt there's going to be much of a fuss about it. I think that's is are, are there other insurance type issues or is that really the issue Catherine? I, th I think that that that's the main issue just reading between the lines and say please forgive me for those people if, I, if i've got your questions wrong um really the next one there's a lot of questions about equipment and i don't know i'm going to let you have a little rest for the moment simon because i think i might 
try and answer this one, but I'd like you to interrupt me if you think I've got it wrong. Okay. Um, but it's all about provision of equipment to employees. Now they're working from home. And my viewpoint on this is about, you know, it's all risk based. Um, and depending on the type of activities staff are doing at home, you know, if they have, if all their work has to be on the computer and they are inputting a lot, their risks are going to be uh, more towards the high risk. They may be able to cope for short term um, with very little support, maybe just a keyboard and mouse. But if this working from home goes on for longer periods, obviously their risk is going to go up, so more equipment needs to be provided. So I think one has to look at the type of work, how long they're at home, and then it will change over a period of time. So you may start off just suggesting they take, you know, they get a keyboard and mouse, or you might be able to give it to them from the office provide some good support about how to set themselves up using a chair I and mean, in fact I've I've provided a, a learning resource about trying to help people with this uh, putting laptops up on biscuit tins and things like that but then if one's in for more for the longer haul actually that you're probably going to need to provide chairs and things like that so that's that's my viewpoint have you got anything you want to add to that Simon yeah I think I think so I, 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 for me first of all in the timing point uh, uh, there is a, there is a, there is a, um, there, uh, some people are trying not to panic everyone and the government are trying not to panic everyone. But to me as a doctor and observer of things, it strikes me as absolutely obvious. This is months and months and months this is going on. There's no quick exit to this. Um, uh, it would, I'd be very surprised if the measures that are being taken now aren't continuing well into the end of the summer but who knows so i think we should assume we're in there for months and uh, it seems to me that the basic case is everyone should have a separate keyboard a mouse and either a either a, a do-it-yourself or a, a simple proprietary um, laptop stand that seems to me absolutely basic and frankly if, it, if it's me doing it i'd want to monitor as well but maybe that's because i just think that, but i don't know if uh, catherine tell me if i'm wrong the screen itself of a laptop does comply with the schedule i think doesn't it because it is adjustable in the right way is that right yes so if long on, as you have a separate a... keyboard and and it's you know fit for purpose you know if you're using huge spreadsheets and the screen is very small then probably not but for most people for most tasks yeah. the screen i think would be appropriate for most people so the but basic, say, and the basic stuff is uh, sorry the basic stuff is very inexpensive a keyboard and mouse um uh, uh, and, and a stand or a biscuit tin so we've got that then the next thing is the seating in the hierarchy in my view and the seating um i really 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 don't want my employees working on a sofa much as they might enjoy it for a bit or working in propped up in pillows in the bed um, I just don't want it and so uh, and most of the time most people have got a dining table and chairs but I know there's a lot of younger generation who don't um, and so I think I think I'd want my early questionnaire which is part of this risk assessment where we want to know what's happening to our workers at home to include you know what type of seating have you got and what type of table have you got to work on and maybe with some tick box options for you know uh, non-adjustable dining chair type chair stroke non-adjustable desk chair stroke uh, adjustable desk chair so that they can tick so you can get feedback and then similarly do you have a table or a desk to work from and and if it's so, so that you would quite quickly know who are your people who are the who are slouching on a sofa and a coffee table and really those are the ones you should go back to and say what are we going to do for you let's pick up the phone what are we going to do for you we really need to do something we are going to invest a couple of hundred quid or whatever it costs and get you you know uh, uh, whatever you need basic 
basic minimum standard of whatever you need. Um, I just can't, I can't yeah. see that we can tolerate people working on sofas and coffee tables as our workplace. And then, you know, the, that, the, then the next level is how we're going to attack the people who are on a dining table. And I suppose that's, that's, that, that's a more mixed thing. It's, are you comfortable? How's it going? If they say, oh, God, it's awful. At the end of every day, I can't walk. My dining chair is really uncomfortable. Well, we better do something about that. But if they say, yeah, I'm all right, you know, maybe we'll leave it for a bit or to, or to deprioritize it. What, what do you think, Catherine? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, I've got lots of questions on, you know, the mechanics of how, in, how to do this. Do we need to do full questionnaires? And I suppose my my thought on this is if you give people the advice as to what you, you hope that they can set up like at home um, and get their feedback and say, can you achieve this? And if not, why not? I think that's quite a pragmatic way to just try quickly to get a hold of the situation because I mean some of our, our um, the people listening today probably have got hundreds if not thousands of employees and the thought of going through numerous questionnaires I think is quite daunting for them but I think it's so important to have a, as you were saying a feedback loop that when somebody has a concern they can make people aware of it and so action can be taken for those people most at risk. Yes yeah. and you need to risk assess <laughs> or plan how detailed your initial risk assessment feedback form is and the formulation mm. of it, because there's no point having a 20 page risk assessment form that you know your workers, only 3% of them are going to respond. Yeah. And you're going to spend the next three months chasing them all or not bothering. And you're going to all of, as an organization, you've fallen flat on your face because it doesn't really help to say we provided them with this stuff. That's, you haven't done the risk assessment. You're the employer. Have you done the risk assessment? So I'd rather have a short, a short form that is going to get a better response than a detailed one. Of course, you can have a short one with links for more information. Uh, but, but yeah, you've got you, you we've got that point. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, absolutely. And I think we also have to remember, actually, yes, we're talking about what the legal requirements are. But if people are able to work comfortably, we're going to they're going to be doing a good job for us, too. And we need we need our businesses to keep going, don't we? So I think it's doing the right thing and getting best out of people actually go hand in hand. So I think oh, I'm going to you pick know. you up there. Yes, I agree. And there was a great question. One of the people who ever sent it in was. Could you say what what's required morally or legally? Mm. And I thought that was very good because, yeah, I, I'd put it another way. How do we do things in our organization? Are we an organization that cares about our people? Mm. If we're an organization that cares about our people, we're going to do this stuff. If, frankly, we don't care, well, okay, if we don't care at all, and I know some of you work in organizations where you bang your head against the... You, feel that you you care you feel the organization doesn't care and that's very tough i realize it's a very yeah. tough balance yeah um got a question here which we i think we've almost answered but i i think come back to it is it reasonable to provide a standard desk chair for thousands of people and i think my my simple answer to that will be if looking at your risk assessment says that this is what you need to do for them considering the work that they do and the situation we're in it may well be I think so. It doesn't you have know. to be a super duper one. And you've yeah. got to work out how to provide it. You've got to work out whether you're going to ship out the existing chairs that you've already got that are no longer being used. But is that going to make you vulnerable because suddenly they'll all come back and you'll lose your chairs? Or yeah. are you going to rent some chairs or have a provider provide them as a gift? And of course, there's all different qualities and standards of chairs. I mean, the schedule only requires a few things that are in a basic um, office chair in terms of bits that move in the right places. And frankly, as an employer, if I'm an employer, I don't, I would like my employees for the next three months, at least that they're going to be working from home. I'd like them to be working from a chair that is an office type chair and not a dining type chair. Personally, 
in terms of answering that moral question, I would like to do it if I could. If I can't do it, okay. Well, if my bosses won't do it, okay. But the advice I'd give is, I think we should probably do it. Well, yeah, Catherine, well, everyone, I suppose you, I'm sure you would agree with that, but <laughs> no, no, you've got I a slight do. interest there and you probably declare. Well, <laughs> but, I was going to say, I mean, and actually, you know, with, with my posture right hat on, and actually, I think I'm probably talking for a lot of industries, unlike toilet roll, there are good supplies. Um, so if people need equipment, they shouldn't be worried about whether they can get it because the, you know they are able to. So um, we've had a few. There's no questions panic about buying that. of office chairs. Uh, there, there, there is a, yet. there is, there's quite a demand, but, oh. but you know, we're getting orders in, and actually China is producing products again. So what I'd just say is, you know, people don't need to be too concerned about whether they'd be able to do it if they, if they feel it is appropriate then they will, will be able to get supplies. Okay, um, anyway, I want to move on, move on from that. Okay. Um, I've got an interesting question about if somebody is unable to work safely at home, they, they can't get a desk in, they don't ever, any, any, any thoughts on what somebody should do if we are aware that somebody is potentially at greater risk working at home? Ooh. What should we do? So, well, it depends. I suppose there's a lot of different categories within that. So yeah. we've got a belligerent employee who says, I'm not interested in that. I've got, I live in a studio flat. I've got a sofa and a, and a coffee table. I'm happy with my laptop. Don't want anything else. Actually, there's probably a lot of people like that, I should imagine. Yeah, I, I, they may all be belligerent, I, but they may I just don't be think saying, I'm not bothered with you. I've got enough things to worry about. I don't yeah. care about this. I'm comfortable. And maybe they are. Maybe they've got really good cushions, a very nice sofa and it works really well for them um well i suppose the feedback form that you're sending out needs to allow for that um but you know it's one one have to think about how to formulate it um uh you know we can only do what's reasonably practicable but yeah it'd be good to formulate that to some degree that um I've opted that I don't care or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've still got an obligation, as I well, said earlier. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, we've still but, got the obligation. But equally, there's only so much you can do. It answers the reasonable practicability. Um, it does answer the reasonable practicability. If you spoon fed your staff and they still say get lost, that answers the reasonable practicability point. You know, because you have. Uh, but yeah, maybe what was that slide and that question I raised a few? slides ago the, uh, um, the one slide back that's it would it have been no forward <laughs> sorry Catherine would it have been reasonably practicable to have done more yeah that's the question look yeah. we offered it to them they said they weren't interested okay yeah well, gosh I'm very worried about time just trying to see if I can get a couple more questions in sorry I'm just having a quick look um Chris, have you seen any that you think I really ought to ask? Sorry. I've got I've got one here about um, we run a lab area in order to try and keep working. Employees are taking bench top lab equipment home. What do we need to do to stay legal and help out employees? I mean. I, I think the short answer is doing a risk assessment, but um, I don't That's know if there's fantastic. anything else you want to add to that. Ben, so lab. lab equipment, what does that mean? Like microscopes and... Don't, uh, don't have any information, uh, but I would imagine Bunsen something... Bunsen burners similar. and test tubes and uh, tripods and, uh, um, and they're doing all that at home. Yeah, well, think about fire if they're doing, uh, doing mm. things regarding gas at home. Um, uh, I'm a, yeah, Catherine, you've given the answer. It's all okay, that's risk fine. assessment. Now, but technically, one's... technically, the DSE regulations only bite on display screens. Yeah. So if a microscope is not a display screen, the all the stuff about the desk and the chair actually doesn't technically apply. But you've still got to risk assess. I think that's a pretty clear answer. That is the answer to that question. Okay. Now this is right up your street. What are the financial penalties if we get it wrong? Ah, 
Well, the financial penalties are that you could be prosecuted, uh, you could be subject to an unlimited fine, and we know that the sentencing guidelines have increased the fines, and they're set out on a set of tables to do with the turnover of your, of your organization, and they can be into the millions of pounds, but I don't think that's very likely here. I'd be very surprised if, um, if anyone gets prosecuted for not having adequate workstations in terms of musculoskeletal issues um, over the virus period. I'd be very surprised. And of course, a lot of people will be in breach, let's face it. Uh, the fact that you're listening to this webinar shows that you're a selected group, very different to the average. Um, a lot of people are just sent people home from work and they don't even think about it. So, um, yeah, um, there is that penalty. But I, 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 I really wouldn't overstate the likelihood anyone's going to be prosecuted. Okay. Uh, even, just... assume the, even assuming the criminal courts are open. Um, well... We've just had the announcement that trials of, under, of over three days have been cancelled. But I'm sure it won't be long before that is way more restrictive and only urgent urgent stuff goes through the criminal courts okay here's one that's interesting uh could we advise people to buy the equipment they need then claim the cost back from the employer um that's a good question um yeah i suppose you, you they could get out of hand with the cost of that um I don't really see a reason why not. If they buy it and you pay for it, I don't quite know whether you now own it. I don't think you now own it. It's a bit complicated. You want to think about what the issues are. Are you compensating them um, for equipment that they then own or you own? If they then own it, it's just like their sofa or their existing desk chair. It's no big deal. They can then answer your question. If you then own it, it's a piece of your equipment but maybe it doesn't make very much difference. The same issues apply, risk assessment, and uh, does it do the job? Right, now I've got, a, I've got a question here that's quite interesting, and it's something I need to do a bit of research on. Um, and I've, I've just had a notice to say that, are we aware that the HSC, of an HSC statement that we don't need to do a DSC assessment during COVID? Um, I have to say I am unaware of that, but I have been quite busy, so I shall be looking into it. But I would still suggest that we need to have a, a, a plan which is based on the situation. So we might not need to do individual DSEs, but we certainly need a risk assessment. What, what, what's your viewpoint on that? Uh, well, that's not, I'm, I suppose I'm not surprised. That's very interesting. It may well be true that the HSE have said uh, you don't need to worry. It's interesting to see how, quite how they've said it. Um, at the end of the day, as we've said in this uh, this discussion, it's all about risk assessment. You still need to risk assess. Um, you've always got to risk assess. You've always got to do everything reasonably practicable. And I suspect what the agency might be saying is, just to let you know, we're not going to prosecute you, which is kind of what what's obvious anyway. But that doesn't really answer the question, because I think most of the people listening to this are going to act with regard to um, home workers on office equipment safety. You, we're going to act based on what we think is the right thing to do, with only a small bit of nudge by the fact, oh yeah, and of course we could be prosecuted. So it's still the legal requirement and it's still the right thing to do. Simon, so I just say we've just done, literally gone and done a view, and yeah. I can confirm um that it says employers if you have people working from home temporarily because of COVID, COVID coronavirus sorry you do not need to do a dse workstation assessments um we have useful advice you can give your workers to minimize the risks to their health and they give a link so for those people that there, there's an update i still um, stand i think with 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 simon in the fact that we still need to look after the health of our staff it doesn't just because we don't need to do an assessment doesn't mean to, make sure that we we make sure they don't get aches and pains and they don't damage their health mm. so i think although we well, may that will be very influential and it will feed into what's reasonably practicable of course um uh, for the office workers the hsc is not your enforcing body for safety 
those are your local authorities you don't have to agree with the hsc yeah um, but nonetheless it's still very influential what the hsc is saying no i just thought it was important to get uh, clarification very on that very interesting yeah. so um yes uh, i think that's um very helpful very helpful yeah. it affects the realities on the ground yeah now simon i think we're going to have to curtail this discussion now um what i'm going to try and do is is, is put all these questions together and I might actually give you a call over a day or two and actually discuss a few other issues and then get them written up. Um, but I would really love to thank you for your input today because I think, I mean, it is important to all of us um, to do the right thing and look after ourselves and our employees and our communities. And I think we just have to to sit and think and plan sensibly. Is there anything you'd like to say before no, we, well, before we finish today? No, well, thank you very today? much for inviting me. And I've, I've, I always enjoy webinars. I've, I've, I think they're a great. Uh, I think it's a great credit to Posturite that you organise this, and, and it's a wonderful way of delivering information. I hope you'll invite me back again for another one. We will do. Thank you so much, and I uh, hope everybody keeps themselves safe. And if you've got any questions, please let us know, and, and I will I will do my best to, to support you through this time. So um, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for listening. Okay. Bye now.